on the island show. Put the nigga black on the man in the building. Do my way to go look at the other dude. Dogs, Chris Rivers, drag us up, and you are rocking with the one the island show with a chunk. Glad that's going to wet. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in right now. From my house to yours, thank you for joining me and for everybody worldwide. I just want to give you guys a big dímelo, que lo que, sapase, que vola, tonses que, konnichiwa, año, ni hao, briviet, shalom, guten tag, wagwan, and what's poppin'? It's your boy, Platano Man, also known as Juan Ayala, if y'all want to know my government name. And I am here with none other. Then the man himself featured on Last Comic Standing, featured on Jimmy Fallon and Comedy Central, just posted his Comedy Cellar set. Go check it out, it's hilarious. Especially for people just getting into marriage and feeling out their relationships, it, it sets the tone. It's amazing. The head, the leader, the host of the Six Foot Nothing Podcast and No Need for Apologies. This guy's a busy man. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. My man. I wanted to see. I wanted to see if you remember my name after that beautiful intro. I I'm glad that I have headphones on. If my wife heard you speaking all those languages, she'll be pissed off. I don't even. I still don't know Spanish, and that like really bothers her. No oh, man, she's Hispanic. My wife was Colombian. Oh man, my, my god. Colombian, so oh, so you basically never win the arguments. <laughs> I don't make no arguments, and I know she hates that whenever she's having a, a good conversation with somebody in Spanish, that she has to translate for me and also make me comfortable. Like, we're not talking about you. We just are talking about <laughs> this. <laughs> I know she hates it. And there's that Babel commercial that's been airing. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? It's, uh, <laughs> and they got, like, a bunch of people learning different languages. And she's like, how come you can't be like them? Because I'm like, they're actors. <laughs> right. That's why I can't be like them. I was like, they're lying. <laughs> they're rehearsing. That's hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it got you. It took you a little bit to get used to that, right? To not feel like you're being neglected and like you got to stand out of all these conversations she's having. I like it just because it's like it's 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 like I get to be in my own little world. And I'm like, even if you are talking about me, it's none of my business because you're doing it in <laughs> another language. So I get right. peace. I get to relax. I'm like, she over speaking Spanish, talking to her friends, and I'm chilling and just allowing my mind to wander, just to roam free. Wow, that's amazing, man. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your new marriage. Since that, since that set that you put up, how was the baby situation, if you don't mind me asking? Trying to have a child now. And now when you're trying to like plan a family, like your world changes now. Like we're still trying. We're, well, I'm trying. She doesn't want to have a quarantine baby. <laughs> Straight up, like, nah, I'm not trying to get pregnant during the quarantine. She, she has like this whole thing of she doesn't want to be pregnant during the summertime because she'll be miserable. And I get it. She's like, if you get pregnant in the wintertime, you're already in the house. You don't have to go out like that. Then by the time you have the baby, it's nice out so you can take the baby out. Right. Exactly. So I'm like, that's uh, that's smart. But if you get pregnant in the summertime, you got an excuse to be big on the beach. That's true. Right? That's you get true. To just be out there getting all that attention because you're in a <laughs> bathing suit and everybody loves pregnant women in bathing suits. That's like the right. They're all like, oh my God, <laughs> you look so good. You're so brave. <laughs> you're so brave. <laughs> so, Yo, that's you hilarious. Going for? Are you going for the compliments or are you going for comfort? Right, right, right. You got to choose now. Yeah. You got to choose now because yeah. there's definitely going to be a lot of brave people this summer talking about they lost their summer bodies because all their gyms are closed. So we're going to yeah. see a lot of bravery I'm, out there. <laughs> probably go, I'm probably going to be one of them. I started this quarantine off strong. Uh, I was exercising. I have resistance bands. And maybe like <laughs> two weeks in, I just abandoned all of that. I was just like, <laughs> nah, I'm good, man. I was stretching the day in the living room, and my wife was like, damn, baby, you stiff as hell. I'm like, I haven't stretched in a month. <laughs> That's the same way I started. I started this whole quarantine off like, yo, I'm going to treat it like a bid. I'm going to just work out every day. And then next yeah. thing you know, I get put onto this Call of Duty war zone, and I'm just like, all right, well, just a couple like more minutes, just another hour, just another two hours. <laughs> yeah, Are you good at the game? I downloaded it, but I haven't really 
played it. My friends are trying to convince me to actually buy the game. That way you can do more. But I'm like, let's see. Let's see. How I got this pretty far out. on it for free. I wouldn't recommend like investing in anything that's unnecessary, especially at a time like this. But this is coming from somebody yeah. that just purchased himself Xbox Live for the quarantine. Bruh. So I mean, I, I mean, as far as am I good at it? Absolutely yeah. not. But I have so much fun playing it. <laughs> do you play with friends or you play with strangers? Oh, I play with friends because strangers on there are just idiots. Like you got to be like a squad. You know what I mean? And I just have like my friends yeah. on like three way, and then we just like squad yeah. up. It's like the best way because then you're just making fun of yourselves losing and everybody else around you. It's it's a good time. It's a, it's a great time killer and it's made the quarantine go by like easy. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. But um, aside from video games and uh, your life during quarantine, because everybody keeps like hitting me up talking about, yo, when is this going to end? When are we going to get through this? And I'm just like, yo, listen, I've been thinking about the same thing about the Knicks my whole life. Bruh. So you can't ask me these yeah. things. Like, I don't know when we're yeah. going to get over this and get through this. But we got to just ride it out. But um, aside from that, tell me, what, what's up? I was about to say, are you the smart friend? Are you the one that has their life put together a little bit more than everyone else? Um, I wouldn't say so you're much. Get all those questions. Yeah, but but I'm definitely like on uh, on the on the cup half full kind of perspective on it. You know what I mean? And and I definitely feel yeah. a lot more informed because a lot of people don't have the luxury to be uh to be in a relationship with somebody who's in the medical field. Like my wife, he's a doctor, so I'm hearing stuff from okay. a primary source, not just people on yeah. Facebook talking about five G and all this extra shit that's like irrelevant. You know what I mean? Yeah, same. My wife is an ultrasound tech. She's in the medical field. And she's, she's always reading up on stuff and telling me what to do. She sprays me down with alcohol every time I leave the house. Every time I leave the house, I come back. She's like, stand there. Don't move. Close your eyes. Put your hands up like this. Lift up your feet. <laughs> <laughs> she basically just like dips you in rubbing alcohol as soon as you walk in. Yo, I hate. I'm probably never gonna use alcohol again after this whole thing. <laughs> Yo, I'm I'm it. probably never gonna drink a Corona after this. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't order that at a bar. Somebody orders that at a bar, you can just look at them like, are you dead ass right now? Like, yo, you gotta. It has to have a, like another name. It's like, yo, let me get yeah. that yellow beer real oh, quick. Yeah, Take word. The <laughs> Take the label off. Put mad beer, napkins around it. Yup. <laughs> <laughs> yo, that's crazy, man. Oh man, but it's it's crazy because you you think that you know so many smart people until you're calling them to check up on them, and they're, and they're like, oh no, I'm outside right now, and I'm just like, bro, why? What are you doing? Like, what's going I just on? Yelled at my mentor. So I have a comedy mentor. That's I I give him all the credit. Even like even up until this point, me being married, I give him all the credit just from. Taking me from this naive little boy to like a man and figuring out my career. And uh, he called me to just like check on me and pitch me an idea. And I'm like, you sound like you're outside. He's like, yeah, I just got back in my car. I'm like, where the fuck you come from? He's like, I, I, right. I had to drop to Philly real quick. Philly? You had to drop to Philly? Are you serious right now? I <laughs> <laughs> said ass. Who does that? Who drives to like, Philly right now during a pandemic? Yo, th this man, he's like, but he 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 won me over because he was like, I have to, I have to get some groceries, but I gotta check on everybody. I'm the one that checks up on everybody and makes sure they're good. And I'm like, but you can still get Corona, just like Facetime him. He's like, I don't do no stupid Facetime. Oh god, that's crazy, man. But I mean, some people are in those kind of situations, you know what I mean, where they have to be that one to like go food shopping for like their el elderly relatives and things like that. And then you have people who are actually going through like spousal abuse and like and like domestic violence is up. Like it's really sad. It's like, yo, are you serious right now? Like now is not the time. Like y'all lock, locked in together. There's couples out there sleeping with boxing gloves on right now. No, I to I told my wife that jokingly. When she was like, what do you think is going to happen during this pandemic? And I was like, well, I'll tell you first that a domestic abuse is going to skyrocket. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, imagine the people who were already in abusive relationships who right. were planning on leaving and trying to leave. And now they don't have anywhere to go. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. horrible, man. That sucks. Yeah.
That really sucks. That's why I'm glad I'm in the situation I'm in. You know what me and my wife, we do? We just watch Netflix and cook each other our favorite foods every day. That's all we do and we just chill. Like, I don't understand. What is the issue with that? Like, why you can't just... Well, whatever. That's a whole morbid yeah. topic for another time. But let's talk yeah. about you. That's episode two. <laughs> yes, episode two. Yo, yeah. you're such a busy man. But I, I want to start from the beginning because... Uh, I've been looking at your career, and it is extraordinary how you were able to flourish from from where you came from. Like, how was growing up dealing with foster care and 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 becoming the man that you are today? I would say when when all you know is that, and you don't have anything to compare it to, you just learn how to live in that. So, like before foster care, my life wasn't great. Like. I still bounce around with my mom because she was in an abusive relationship with my dad and she was on the run and all of that other stuff. So when I went into foster care, it was just the same type of situation, just me bouncing around, living with different people. Some houses were great. Some houses weren't. But I went into care probably, I think I went into care at the age of seven Hmm. and I aged out at 21, meaning like, I, I aged out where it's like I can no longer get any more assistance from foster care. I was no longer a ward of the court. I did get my own apartment at 19 till 21. And that was like something I definitely took advantage of uh, nice. because like like they only really offer housing to like women with children. But there's like mm. loopholes and stuff for men. And I definitely figured that out. But growing up in foster care and living with a bunch of different people. Um, I mean, it was a mixed bag. I think it makes me well-rounded in the sense of understanding struggle right. and understanding and having a little bit more empathy. Like I don't, I don't have, I have sympathy, but not too much. I have empathy. I can hear somebody's story and I go, I, I understand what you're going through. I can relate. Even if mm. I can't relate, I'm still like. Well, I'm taking into what you're I'm taking your story into consideration and all that other stuff. So I as bad as my childhood was, I still feel like it gave me all the tools to become an adult. Wow. Because I feel like if you don't go through anything, not saying if you don't go through anything that you you won't be a well-rounded person. But usually when you do have your own personal like struggles and things you had to deal with your adversity you have a respect for life right right you know that's how i feel i feel like i i have a respect i don't take shit for granted and then comedy it helps because i'm used to the rejection i know how to push through shit i can look at like adversity and comedy and and like look back to my life and go, ah, I've been through worse. My mom was on drugs. So what? They didn't pick up this show. I can do that. And I know <laughs> it's pretty fucked up. I know it may sound fucked up. But, but it helps. That's like, the, yeah, it's like one of the best s- shitty gifts you can get. It's like socks. It's like getting socks for Christmas. It's like, I didn't want these, <laughs> but God damn it, the, I, I needed them. And the shitty childhood is like socks. It's like, I didn't want this childhood, but for this career, I needed it. I needed something to give me tougher skin. And what drove you to comedy? Not having, not feeling like I had a purpose. And, uh, like, I wasn't good at anything. Like, I, like, when all my friends went to college and, like, when your friends go to college and you don't, you feel lonely as hell. When all of your friends are like gearing up and like they 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 know their majors, they they're packing up to leave and all that stuff, and then they're asking you what you're going to do. It's kind of like an eye opening where it's like, oh shit, I never had a plan. I was just moving around life right. with no plan. And like I started at 21, and at that point, all my friends graduated and they have all they had all these experiences, and I didn't really have anything. And uh, a couple of my friends would always be like, yo, you funny as hell, man. You should be like a comic or something. And I'm like, oh, OK, I, 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 I don't really know. I don't think that's like a thing that I'll do. I had a foster mom tell me one time, the only one foster mom used to sit and watch coming to the stage on BET. You remember the show? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I used to love that show. I watched that. Uh, Coming to the stage was amazing. Seasons. That Comic View. Yeah, we used to watch Comic View and Coming to the Stage all the time. And like she said to me one time, she was like, "I can see you doing something like that." And I'm like, Aww. "Really?" She was like. Yeah, she was like, I can see you being an actor. I can see you doing something in entertainment. So don't don't look at that as is, is an option. And I was like, okay. And I remember the <laughs> following summer, the following summer, I'm sitting on the, this is like after I graduated high school and everything, I'm sitting on my friend's porch early in the morning just doing nothing because i used to wake up early to go hang out and do absolutely nothing like i was that annoying kid that would be right. knocking on your door at like eight in the morning and and you could hear the mom yell like yo monroe downstairs i'm not getting out of my bed so somebody gotta let him in and i was that <laughs> kid so i was just like go <laughs> hang out <laughs> i was just annoying like that so i would go hang out at my homie hassan crib and we would just sit on the porch and just just talk about people in the neighborhood and make jokes and shit. And then we seen one of the comics who I'm not gonna say his name, but one of the comics that I like loved on the show. He didn't win, but he can't, he got really far. And I seen him on the back of the trash truck. Like wow. he, the trash truck went by and he just throwing in garbage. And I'm like, yo, and I'm excited. I'm like, yo, the such and such. I'm like, yo. What's up, man? I love your stuff. Like, <laughs> hey, and he was ignoring the hell out of me. Like, I kept what? calling him. And he, How he you a diva when with... that's your job? Exactly. <laughs> but he eventually, I, I kept going. And then eventually he went, yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it. But I guess to him, he probably was like, man, I was just on TV and now I'm back to this job. But for me, that was like, yo, he was just on TV. Word. And the motherfucker still has a job. Like, Maybe they're right. Maybe I can do this. Because right. when you think of like comedy, when you don't know comedy, you think of superstars. You think of the people yes. who are already household names. So right. that's Eddie not Murphy, realistic Jim Carrey. Right. Exactly. But what that did was that let me know that it is also a, it's doable and it's something that you can do while doing other stuff. So I started. Uh, I started probably a couple years after that moment because I was just like, I just never let that go. Like, I was just like, fuck, man, I'm going a, I'm to a do it one day, one day. And just a year went by, then another year went by, and then 21 hit. And I was like, and I had a friend named Wes Gill. His name is John Gilbert, but he was a poet, and poets always change their name to get more bitches. <laughs> you know that, right? Like, Yo, why is always, that? Yo, the motherfucker, <laughs> his name is John Gilbert, but he changed his name to West Gill. And he was a really dope poet, and yeah. he was really funny, and he used to do, uh, like, jokes within his poetry, and he was, like, great at it. And I and we would hang out, and I would just keep telling him, I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to do stand-up one day. I'm, I'm going to do it one day. And he tricked me. He went, He was like, yo. I'm about to hit this open mic up at the Laugh House. You should come with me. I'm like, yeah, bet. I'll go with you. I get there. He signs both of us up. He goes on and bombs. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's my oh, turn. No. I go up there. Yo, I go up there and bomb. Damn. But it was like I'm sweating. All that shit. There's like maybe I the new people. Uh, I think the new people have to go on in the end. Like when they don't know you at all, right. you go super last at the open mic. They say right, it's right, random, right. but it's not. Right. It's only random when they don't know you. But when they know you, they'll they'll be like, all right, we'll put you up fifth or we'll put you up first or whatever. So I was there from 8 o'clock to like 11 o'clock. And I was the last one to go on. And like four people stayed. And I invited some people from my foster care program and they came out and it was horrible <laughs> and that was bad. But what ended up happening <laughs> in that situation is there was like four comics who stayed and afterwards they went like those jo your jokes were awful. There was like you also were like every when you first start doing comedy, you borrow from people, you borrow from your favorite comics. So they were like those jokes you did were Richard Pryor's, but your personality is really good. Like you, you you're genuine. I can tell that you that you have something. And they were like, 
yo, come with me to this other show. And that's how I started doing comedy. Wow. Like, literally, I went, I sucked, and that's all you needed is somebody, other comics who, they weren't bad, they were way better than me, but they were still an open mic too, but they were like, oh, you're somebody who can potentially get good at this. Let me show you how to actually do it. And they showed me all the open mics. They showed me all the the bar shows. And I just started hanging out and being in that community. I stopped for like two months for, uh, for like stupid relationship reasons. But right after that, I was back into it. And I never stopped again. Wow. And, and I started in Philly. I don't know if you know that. I'm from Philly. Okay, so okay. I started, yeah, I started in Philly, which is different. Especially compared to New York and New York. Everything's more spread out in Philly, right? Everything is spread out, but everything is, it's, Philly is so serious. Hmm. So open mics were shows. So I'm saying four people stayed, but for, at the beginning of the open mic, it was packed. It wow. was a show. Right. Like actual audience members came and paid <laughs> to watch people find their voices. Wow, and they took it serious. So if you bombed, they made fun of you. They be like, they would fucking like try to hurt your feelings. So I also <laughs> like learned to develop that tough skin, right? From just starting comedy in Philly too. That's crazy. It's never easy either. Yeah. Like just jumping into something brand new like that, and then trying to like learn the ropes because, like, especially jumping into like stand up, that's like trying mm. to like jump into like a like a like a pool of cold water it's just like you dip your yeah. toes in and you know it's freezing but you know once you get in there you're gonna be all right but it's just the idea yeah. of jumping into it is just like what holds you back sometimes you know yeah the, i call it the i like that you said like that i call it the needle effect mm. i go the the worst part of the the only thing that hurts is the the thought of it when you right. actually start to do it you get used to the pain it becomes a like it becomes an uh, a discomfort that you're used to, and then when you're used to something, you make it a part of your life. Like working out hurts. Right. Working out doesn't feel good until you <laughs> start to get familiar with that pain. And there's the same thing with bombing in Philly, is that you you get so bad that you start to go. I don't give a fuck about this. I don't care about this. <laughs> like, I'm used to you not laughing and liking my stuff. So now let me start to be me a little bit more. Let me start right. to open up. Because if you're judging me based off of something I'm trying to be, then let me be myself. And so you, I, I, you ended up building like a callus to it. That's fantastic I'm lucky that advice. I started in Philly, though. Because moving in New York, New York isn't a piece of cake at all <laughs> no. but the one thing that i got in philly that i didn't get in new york was you like i came to new york with friends already i came with kind of like a squad like it was me then my best friend Derek, who i do the podcast with and then other people started coming up and mm. philly sticks together the right. moment you tell a comic you're from philly they're like, oh, you good then. You came to New York, you good. Let me show you right. all the places to go. And I came here funny-ish already because I, I worked my way up in Philly until I was able to feature, until I was able to like be able to make some money back home. So I came here funny. I came here with an act. And how was and your first New York show? Like That must have like given you the bubble guts. Were you nervous? Were you like scared? Like How did you feel going to your first New York City show? My first New York show. Yeah. I, my first New York show was a show at Stand Up New York ran by two comics named Jamie Roberts and, uh, fuck, I'm going to forget the other guy's name. I know he's going to hate me, but it's like some, it's not Smokey Suarez because I did his show like right after. Smokey Suarez does like urban rooms that are okay. like, tough. Right. But, I used to do a mixture. So when I first moved to New York, I did New York Comedy Club, and it was always get canceled. It was like mm. a 12 o'clock show, and every time I, I would take the bus to New York, Damn. I would get here early. I would walk around until uh, like I would like hang out at different spots, 
until my show started. And every time I got to the club, it got canceled. And one Damn. time it didn't get canceled. Yeah. One time it didn't get canceled. And it was like seven people there. And it was fun. That's I had awesome. a good time. All the nerves were gone because I was like, this shit is always getting canceled every time I get And so you was just eager. Here. Yeah. I'm like, oh, shit, there's actually a show. And I yeah. just did my material. And I I started, like, finding different mics. And I would do the hood rooms. But I will also make sure that I hung out at the mainstream rooms because that's, like, some advice that uh, a comic by the name of Anton Schufert gave me when I was living in Philly. Hmm. He was like, your career will go further if you're funny in both places and not without changing who you are. If you can go to the hood and do the same material that you do in the mainstream, that's how you know it works. And I would just practice that and keep doing that. And um, I did comedy everywhere. And then I met my mentor, Keith Robinson. And I met him through one of my late friends named Chris Cotton, who passed away last year, uh, at the end of last year. And he introduced me to Keith. And okay. I knew who Keith was because Keith was on Tough Crowd. Uh, he he was on Comedy Central. Like, he did all the stuff that you needed to do to be legit in this business. And so, I met him at the Laugh House. Go ahead. So up until the moment where you met Keith, how many shows are you doing a week? How many as sets many would you say you had? Y'all. <laughs> I, I still I still make fun of I still make fun of myself for this, but I used to have a, a Excel spreadsheet of every single open mic, every single produce show, every single club show, and I would grade them and I would write down who the booker was and I would say how the audience was and how the comics was, mm. and I at least did five shows a night. Wow. I did five I did five a night. Five I would I would do five mics a night. Five mics a day. My mics would start at two o'clock all the way until the last one, which would if I if I could make it to the lantern on time, I would be there by like eleven o'clock. And they would try to make you bark, but I learned the loophole. And the loophole is so you don't have to stand outside and beg people to come in, offer the host or go first. Hmm. always offer to bite that bullet go yo i will take the spots nobody else wants to do so if nobody wants to host i'll host if nobody wants to go first i'll go first and i would do that and that and that like allowed me to get more stage time i would hang out this place called Times square art center and they had like five rooms and i would go there and i would do you had to do the shitty shows first like the shows that they were just holding people in until they can get them to the bigger stage in the main right. room. I would do those. Man, I do like five to six shows a night. That's crazy. And that's what Every they call it, day. barking? Or is that what you just call it when you're outside selling tickets? No, they call it barking. So when you see somebody <laughs> selling tickets yeah. or trying to get you into a show, it's called yeah. barking. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know there was a name for that. But I yep. can see why. I can totally see why it's called that. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So you, you meet your mentor. Yeah. I hate him at first because I this is my second time meeting him. The first time I met him, okay. uh, one of the comics a, in Philly by the name of Belinda, she was like, hey, Keith. And I realized she didn't know him like that either. So she was kind of throwing me under the bus because she just knew that he was a big name. And he was just like, he would do this thing where he would pop him to the Laugh House and he would see what new comics were there and who was funny and who had potential. And he'll tell him to come to New York. So... Belinda introduced me to Keith. She went, hey, Keith, this is Monroe. He's a very funny comic. And he went, he looked at me and looked at her. He went, I don't want to meet the nigga. And then he walked off. <laughs> right? The, the, the. Said, what the fuck? I was like, this dude is rude, yo. Word. I, I, held, I held that in my heart until Chris, until my homie Chris was like, yo, I want you to, uh, I'm going like, I'm about to go meet up with Keith Robinson. He he grew up with my my uncles and my dad and stuff. So he's going to he's going to just like hang out with me and tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing. And I was right. like, I don't want to know Keith. He's mean and this that and the third. 
But then I met Keith, and eventually he was like, oh, I was just fucking around. He was just like, I probably, he's like, I probably walked off into the room, and then I came back out, and you were gone. He was like, what? <laughs> I was just fucking around. Like, I was joking with you, but I'm sorry you're so sensitive. But, like, after that, we became, like, we got closer and closer. The first time he ever seen me perform, it was hilarious because my friend Chris was hard headed. He was the fun. He's like one of the funniest dudes ever. But if you go, Chris, this is what you need to work on. This is what you need to do. He'll be like, Nah, nah, I'm gonna do it my way. This, that, and the third. <laughs> so Keith got so frustrated with Chris. He went, Yo, what? what do you got five minutes? And I'm like, Yeah. He was like. All right, I'm going to set you up with some stage time to see what your five minutes is like. And I'm like, oh, shit, okay. Because he's been talking about Montreal this whole time. He's like, you right. got to have a five-minute set that tell that tells a story about yourself, and you got to be Montreal ready. That's what it is. If you get Montreal, you'll always have a career. So wow. I'm like, all right, let me work on my five. Let me work on my five. He gets me, he gets me some stage time at this place called CB's Comedy Club, which is up the street from the cellar. Okay. I do five minutes. It goes great in my book. I have people. Yeah, I have people laughing in your book. In my book, in my book oh, it was no. great. Yeah, in my book it was great. I I had people laughing. I had the comics in the back laughing, and I and I'm walking out. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. We're leaving the club. But we're, we're walking up the street to the cellar, and then he he looks at me. He goes. What the fuck were you talking about? I'm like, wait, huh? He goes, what? What was that said about? I'm like, oh, you know, th those are the jokes I've been working on. Those are the jokes that work. He's like, yeah, they work. People laugh, but you didn't say shit. None of that. None of what you said in that set says anything about you. And I had, I had a joke one time. I had a joke that he hated, and the joke was, um. I was like, I was in a relationship at the time, and I was like, "Yeah, man, me and my girlfriend got in an argument because she pushed me. Uh, like, there were, a rat ran in front of us while we was waiting for the train, and she got scared and pushed me forward. And I'm like, that's fucked up because she didn't think about my well being. If I get bit by that rat, I'll have to move to the sewers, learn Chinese, <laughs> teach some turkey. And see, you laughed." But he was like, what the fuck? You did a Ninja Turtles joke? Ninja How Turtles old are you? Joke, yeah. yeah. He was like, How old are you? You're too old to be doing Ninja Turtles joke. He was like, What's your life like, yo? Like, talk about yourself. And I, I let that sink in. And then, like, a day later, he called me. He was like, I'm sorry if it came off mean, but what I'm trying to say is you have to give the audience something to take home. He's like, if you're just up there doing cute jokes about Ninja Turtles, he wouldn't let this joke go. He's like, you're doing cute <laughs> jokes about being Ninja Turtles and shit. He's like, what the fuck do they remember about you? Wow. All you're going to be is Ninja Turtle, man. You're going to be the dude who told the Ninja Turtle joke. They don't know shit wow. about you. And he was like, talk about your life. What was your life like? And I was like, at this whole time, I like... I never talked about growing up in foster care. The people who knew I was a foster kid knew just because those were the friends I made while in foster care. Right. But I wasn't open about my, my experience. So when I told him, I was like, well, you know, like I grew up in foster care and like I'm building a relationship with my mom. I'm still cool with my, my like me and my sisters are close. I talked to my grandmother, but I'm distant from like a lot of people. He's like, talk about that shit. He's like, that's what the fuck is going to get you in the door to all of these clubs. And I'm like, really? He was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, but it ain't funny. And he was like, he gave me a good piece of information. He was like, be interesting. Fuck funny. He was like, if it's interesting, the funny will come later. But if you up there and you're talking about your life and mm. you're talking about who you are, that gives people, that, that buys you time to you to find the joke. And I started... And from that day, I was I started talking about growing up in foster care, and I watched five mics turn into seven. Watch wow. five mics, watch seven mics turn into real, actual produced shows, wow. where you're making twenty five dollars or you're getting a drink ticket. And he was right. Like I watched, I I started to build a career at that moment. Like the moment I started like really talking about growing up in foster care and talking about my mom being on drugs and my dad being in prison and talking about the various foster parents I had, 
I watched it open up. Like all the club, not all the clubs, but most of the clubs, I was able to do guest spots at. I was able to do check spots. Uh, Godfrey vouched for me to get into a couple of clubs. Keith vouched for me. Kurt Metzger, like working comics in New York, started to like vouch for me and help me wow. get on. Shout out to Godfrey. Then, Shout out to Keith. Godfrey, Keith, like, all those guys. Amy Schumer. Like, yeah, like for real. Big so, names. Mm hmm. And, and these is when they were like coming. Like, Schumer was. The Schumer show hadn't launched yet. She still shot it, but she knew me through Keith. We're not mm. like friend, like best friends, but like I can go, hey, what up? She's like, what up, my bro? And we can make a joke here and there. But like she like skyrocketed, but she would like show, and I don't think she ever remembers this, but it was like stand up New York. And this is after Godfrey already vouched for me because Godfrey did this thing. That was like amazing that you could ever do for a comic. There was a booker who wanted Godfrey to work the club. And he was like, yo, man, you haven't been here in a long time. I would really like to get you like back on the lineup. I'll give you any weekend you want. And at this point, I already did guest spots for Godfrey at like clubs in Philly and stuff like that. And I was or I was hanging at the bars like right after open mic and Godfrey went does Monroe work here? And he was like, no, nah, not really. He just does like, he does the open mic. And he went, well, I'll I'll start to put in my veils if you start to give him spots. And nice. I went, what? Nice. And he and, and Benji did. Benji started giving me spots after that. And it just to watch like the vouchers that I got from other comics because I started like talking about my life and like being open on stage. I got Last Comic Standing off of that, and then I got Montreal. So I got wow. Last Comic Standing because I had, uh, yeah. So That's crazy. Thank you, yeah. Thank and you, so Keith. brave of you, too, man, because not everybody could just put their whole life out there. You know what I mean? You could have easily become yeah. a victim of your own creativity and just put all of your personal info out there and, and not resulted in anything. But you, you ended up flourishing and perfecting your craft with that. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. That's, a, that's a true gift that you have, man. I, I Thank you. I just looked at it like, even if he's wrong, what does it like? How does it hurt? Right. So even if he was wrong about like, let's say I did do all of that and I didn't get and nobody gave a fuck. And then they would just be like, hey, the, here's this dude being sad again. Then I could just do things my way. So I went, right. well, let me try his way to see if if I'll get any traction. And it That's wasn't crazy. easy at first because I definitely wanted to run away from it because I would do a joke here and there. And other comics on the show would be like, oh, man, like, why you got to do that? Why you got to go up there and talk about your mom being on drugs? Like, you're just making an audience sad. I remember telling Keith that. And Keith would be like, who gives a fuck? None of y'all are millionaires. Nobody on that show is a household name. So who cares if you're if you're working on this shit? He's like, get better. Work it. Like, get through it. Like, fuck those people. Yeah. I just kept doing it. And then those same people would come to you and they'd be like, so I got this joke on this going, like this happened with my mom. How do I work through that angle? And then I became that guy that can help people with their personal shit. And I'm like, but you are the motherfucker who told me don't do it. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So fast forward. Yeah. Now you're at in Montreal now. Your your career yeah. is is like literally blowing up in front of your eyes. You put in all this hard work, all this time devoted, and uh, you it got you to Jimmy Fallon, which we're gonna get to in a second. But you get yeah. to Montreal. How was how was getting there? Like that flight was it like nerve wracking? Like were you anticipating like flight. a crazy large audience? Were you hype? Like how were you feeling? And how did so it go? First of all, there's no flight. <laughs> it's your it's your managers driving you to the gig because uh, when you're a new, but like when I went up until now, I think they changed it. But you got a two hundred fifty dollars stipend, and you got a, a hotel. But it was up to you to figure out how to get there. And because hmm. my manager had two clients in the festival that year. 
and benefited him to drive up there. So we just all drove up there together and I was just was asleep in the back of the car for about nice. what, eight hours. Um, so Damn. I auditioned for Montreal three times. And every year, I, every year, I, I, the first year I auditioned, I was probably awful. I wasn't. I I was working out the material about being personal, but I still wasn't myself. I would wear like a sweater vest with a button-up shirt underneath it and all that. Like I was trying too hard. Then the second year, uh, I thought I got it, but one of the bookers who I ended up getting cool with called me, which he doesn't do for a lot of people. He went, "Look, I don't do this for anybody, or and if I do." It's it's maybe for five people tops. I'm calling you to let you know you didn't get it. But mm. here's why you didn't get it. Oh. And here's and this is why you'll get it next year if you just do X, Y, and Z. And he broke it down for me. And he was just like told me that this is the, like the things I needed to work on was getting my story together, uh, being able to control the crowd a little bit more, mm. um, controlling the room and all that stuff. And just like generating some heat so i was like okay um montreal came and went a guy recommended for the last comic standing through keith to wanda and all he said was just like hey look at look at this young fella tell me what you think uh i think he sent her a t- i think my manager sent in the tape they liked it they flew me out i did the same material that i did for montreal for them they liked it. They were like, all right, we want you to audition on TV. I did the same material. Wow. But while, but while like, I, like you got to submit your set for, like, standards and practices. Like, you just can't right. go on TV and say whatever you want. So I submitted my set for standards and practices. I got a bunch of flack on what I could and, can't, what I could and can't say. They were like, well, you can't talk about your, your foster moms because we don't have uh, – we don't we don't have like a, a signed contract giving wow. you permission to do that. You can't talk about your mom. You can't talk about any of this stuff because you, uh, you can get sued. And so now they're lady, just like copying and editing your whole set for you. Yeah, that's annoying. One lady, yeah, it's annoying. But here's the here's the the I guess the blessing in that. There's a lady who was like I don't know. She was like some sort of producer. And she pulled me to the side and she was like, yo, I seen the emails that they sent you. Um, I'm a, I will say this. Let them choose what you can't say on. The, let them uh, let them handle what you can and can't say in editing. Don't go up there and say and, and uh, give in to what they're t- telling you. You can't right. can't say. She was okay. like, I seen your set. I think it's hilarious. It's very personal. It's funny. It's not offensive. Go up there, say the set, let them determine, let them decide if they don't want to air it or not. I went out there. I did the set that I wasn't supposed to do. Uh, Some people were like, what the fuck was that? (laughs) And then some people, but the judges, Keenan, Roseanne, uh, all of them were like, that was fucking dope. Word. And I just moved on to the next round, and I kept doing that. I kept That's dope. showing up and doing the set that I wasn't supposed to do. Uh, Wanda didn't care because <laughs> I wasn't bombing and I was going out there killing, so she didn't have a problem with it. And the best advice was let legal handle that shit. Let them handle that shit Word. in post. If they don't want to air the set, there's 250 other comics they can replace you with. But go out there and kill. And I would do that until I was off the show. And then when I got off the show, I was still I was already in L.A. And I had already auditioned from Montreal for the for the third time. And I was in L.A. and I seen the producer again. And he was like, I just he was like, I, the because I did two different sets. I did. OK. Uh, a different set. I did one set for my initial audition, and then I did a completely different set for my callback. But I did it to flex. I did it mm. to show growth. I did it to be like, yo, like I'm a different dude now, yo. Like it's not one set. Like I can go up there and I can talk about anything, which I couldn't. I just, uh, I just had that 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 confidence. Right, right, so, right. So 
I did two different sets, and we were at dinner, and he was like, yo, just make sure that the set you did for your first callback is the set you do in Montreal. And I went, does that mean I got it? And he was like, what does it sound like to you? And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell anybody. I didn't tell That's anybody. Crazy. I played dumb. Like, all my friends are like, yo, man, I don't know if I got it. Did you get it? And I'm like, I don't know if I got nah. it. But I'm I, got, I knew I got it, like, months before Word. anybody knew they were supposed to get it. So I got it. Word. I went over there. I had a blast, yo. You, put, you do two shows. You do a you do your main show, and then you do your encore show. Your main okay. show is, like, in a, a theater. So... And it's like nothing but like execs and all that shit. So oh, go on wow. say, yeah. But at this point, I'm like, Keith already was like, yo, you already did last comic standing. You're used to performing in front of industry. You'll be fine. So I went out there at that mindset. But as soon as I hit the stage, the microphone cord fell out of the no. uh, mic, right? And everybody no. was like, oh. <laughs> and I waited. I plugged it in. And I forgot what I said, but it was like off the top of my head. I think it was something in the realms of like, I'm a like, calm down. I'm a professional or some shit like that. And they were like, ah, and just <laughs> did my set, killed. Um, <laughs> then I did the encore show. It was like at a bar show. And then I did my set there, killed. Bill Burr was like, you that kid that do the material about going up in foster care? I was like, yeah. He's like, that's really funny. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, wow. yeah, that's fucking dope. That's right. crazy. That's I'm a like, Yo, co-sign. Dope. Dude. So wow. uh, Alonzo Bowden, he gave me a little bit of props because he's one of my favorite comics. You know who Alonzo Bowden is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That dude is slick with it. Like, <laughs> man, that that dude is like on port. He's sharp. So he like gave me a little head nod or whatever. And um, I'm standing at the bar with my managers and like... Like, if you kill in Montreal, everybody's just going to be asking to do meetings with you. And that's what was mm-hmm. happening. Like, it was like a bunch of comics that I went over there with. And we were all just, like, texting each other. Like, yo, I got a meeting with such and such. Oh, shit, I got a meeting with this person. So we're, like, talking about all the meetings that we're getting. And, right. like, all the people we're getting, uh, like, that are, like, asking us to do their projects and stuff like that. So... I'm sitting at the bar and my managers were talking and then one of the producers of Montreal comes over and he goes, hey, uh, can you do a gala tonight? And I'm like, absolutely. A gala <laughs> is like a live televised taping right. uh, for Canadian TV. Okay. He's like, it only pays twenty five hundred. I was like, how much? It was like two thousand five hundred. I'm like, bet. <laughs> right. It turned out to be Jim Gaffigan's gala. So wow. it was like a show that, yo, it was me, Jim Gaffigan, <laughs> Judy Gold. Uh, and it was like two Yo, other your people, life is crazy, was, brother. Yo, it was fucking crazy. <laughs> like, it you just crazy, went from you Bill Burr co signing you to performing at Jim Gaffigan's gala right now. Like, yo. that's crazy. <laughs> and shout Dude, out to Alonzo Bolden. Dude, Alonzo Bolden, like, I don't know. I hope they remember. I just hope, but like, because that meant a lot for me. To right. Me. Just like those people who you watch on TV. Absolutely. Yeah. Head nod and be like, yo, you funny. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yo. It blew my mind, yo. <laughs> so then I do the gala. I have a good time. I have a good set. I was, I, I, in the beginning, I was a little nervous because the laughs are different. And he told me that. He was like, the mm-hmm. laughs are different here. And I'm like, what do you mean? He went, you have to take your time. He's like, you'll say a joke. You'll hear the people up front laugh. But don't move on until you hear the people in the back laugh. And I was like, huh? Mm. That don't make no sense. But it's true because I would do I did a joke and you hear ha ha ha. And now you're trying to chase that laugh. Yes. But what happens is the sound has to come back towards you. Mm. So at first, like the first two minutes, I'm going rapid fire right. because I'm like, oh, shit, they're not laughing. But then some of my mind just goes, calm the fuck down, take your time. And I calm down, take my time, and you can hear the laughs coming back. And they're mm. coming back to you like, boom, you drop it. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Doom, another one. Ha, ha, ha. And I was like, oh, this is different. 
Like, you got to be a different type of comic to perform in a theater like that. Wow. Because you got to have patience. You got to have time. And, like, when you're in a club, you can you can just rapid fire those jokes right. off because they're right there in front of you. Right. But, and you're dealing with, like, speakers. And in a, in a situation like yours, you're dealing with acoustics. Yeah. Wow. I And I, I know Jim Gaffin's going to see this, but I, I was so excited in that moment. I accidentally went to the wrong dressing room. Turns out it was his dressing room for him and his family. And oh, there was no. a Teddy. There was like the there was like a um what there was a jar of mayonnaise in there this. and you were like, This isn't my dressing room. <laughs> no, it was a uh it was the mascot for the JFL thing. So it's okay. like the little green devil with the red horn things. It was a teddy bear, stuff like animal thing. And I'm in there. And they come in and they go, yo, oh, this is this just a room is for Jim Gaffigan and his family. And I'm like, okay, shit. All right, I got to go. And I take the teddy bear and I leave because I'm like, yo, fuck it. I need a souvenir to remember this moment. So, I take so it you I jacked leave. his bear? So you hear somebody on a walkie-talkie go, anybody see the, the stuffed animal that we left in yeah. Jim Gaffigan's just a room? That was for his kid. And, and we were out. And we were oh, out. No. We left the venue. <laughs> this was a Sunday night. We left the venue. We jumped right. right in the car and went to New York. And I was like, yo, I'm never telling anybody that I stole Jim Gaffigan's kid stuffed animal. But what the fuck? So I stole that shit. Yo, Doug, like, yo, you already know, yo. You want that teddy bear back? You got to put up the bands. <laughs> I um, And then the way... Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to think. Fallon happened a little different. Fallon happened in 2015. I actually, had so how did you get? Right how did you get that exactly? So I got that in a different way. My managers had. A, my managers got offered the job okay. as a as the bookers of the Fallon show, but That's one him. of the deals were yeah, one of the deals were they couldn't they couldn't have any of their talent on the show unless it got approved by somebody on the by somebody above them. So okay. the the Fallon people knew who I was because uh they wanted me to audition, but I never I didn't get a chance to audition. To, I think it was like something stupid. Maybe it was my fault, maybe it was their fault, but I didn't really get a chance to audition. And I and I would hear horror stories about people who had to audition like forty five times to get it. And I was like, I'm not wow. doing that. Like I'd rather just do a set somewhere else. Like I'd rather just do a set for another network than to do it there. And they were like, Shut up. Right. Submit the set. See what they say. And right. for like a week I ran around with my managers trying to get this set together. And out of frustration, I was like, Yo, let's just go to stand up let's not stand up in New York. Let's go to New York Comedy Club. And I'll do the set I want to do. And they were like, okay, whatever. Just let us record it. I go to st I go to New York Comedy Club. I do a very loose version of the set that I did on The Tonight Show. They liked it. They submitted it. And then like um, maybe like close to a month later, they was like, yo, you got it. You're, you're recording in August. I went, get the fuck out of here. Wow. I, bought, I had it. Yo, I, I, I didn't get nervous until afterwards. Hmm. Like after I had to the set, set in was done, yeah. <laughs> but but like beforehand, it was me, uh, my boy Derek, my roommate Chloe, um, my managers. None of my family was there. I told myself the next time I ever do like a uh, like a late night, I'll definitely bring my sisters because I want them to see that type of environment. But it was like my boy Vlad, and I had a good time. I had a good time. Quest Love thought we were related because he was like, yo, your dad wasn't around and my dad was a Rolling Stone. He's like, you think that we may be related? I was like, no, I, I made that <laughs> That's mad dad. cool. I was like, my dad was a piece of shit. But I took a picture with him. I signed, I signed his drumsticks. I signed his book. Wow. I met, uh, May Whitman, the lady that uh, you ever watch um, Good Girls on NBC? Yeah, not No, but I've heard of it. Oh, she's on that show. She's also okay. she's uh she played um a Michael uh George Michael Bluth girlfriend, the one that nobody oh, Okay, liked. and Arrested so Development. Was on Arrested De yeah. Right. She's on that show. I jo I met uh Kegel Mike I said Kegel. Uh, 
Facebook. What's his name? Uh, 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 Michael Key. Uh, Jordan Peele. Bruh. No. No, Jordan the other Peele, one. I meant that. Keegan. Key. Right. I think. Keegan. I met Keegan uh, and Kevin Spacey. I met all of <laughs> Did them. Did he try to touch I'm you? Keegan. What, Kevin Spacey? No. <laughs> I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC. <laughs> Did he turn it to Frank Underwood on you? <laughs> Like, you gotta keep this a secret. <laughs> you gotta keep uh, no. He, I, I met him. It was like in passing, but uh, Keegan, I did the joke about the Incredible Hawk, and he was like, "That was fucking funny. That was a hilarious <laughs> joke." He was like, "That was funny," and I'm like, "Holy shit!" So that was a good moment for me. In between that, I did something with Comedy Central. That was fun. I did uh, Adam Devine's house party. So I've been trying to work. I've been trying to just do something every year, which I'm trying to up it. But like I've tried to be on TV at least once or twice a year, no matter what it is. I did Guy Code. Uh, I'm on this show called Dating No Filter. That's on E. But I'm like, I try to keep my face out there. And how are you? How are you? Um how are you going to like flourish in a, in a time like this where uh, people like Dr. Fauci are saying that concerts and large gatherings might be canceled or postponed until fall 2021? Somebody like you that books so many shows and does five sets a night and and thrives off of doing live shows like this. Uh, I definitely don't do five shows a night anymore. I calm right. down. I'm trying to I definitely try to. I, I'm trying to develop stuff and sell shows and stuff like that and that's been my main focus now because that's where that's where longevity is that's how you can afford to keep doing comedy like you can do comedy every night but i want you gotta i i don't want to be nickeling and diming it so i try to sell shows i i i was pitching shows for a while you can still do that stuff that's you true. Know, like that I, is true. I pitched the podcast to a network. I pitched the TV show to a network. I just, I'm just trying to do that a little bit more, which is a whole different ball game. You got just like you learn how to do stand up. You got to learn how to v- develop a show because right once you sell it, they're going to be like, all right, so what is this show? How does it look? And right. you got to get better at that. So that's that's the game I've been working on. I haven't done stand up since that Comedy Central set. The Comedy Central set that on ComedyCentral.com and stuff like that online. That's the last set I did. That was like March fifteenth. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a month and going on another. It's been like what a month and going on another month now. So, I. I haven't really been doing stand up. I haven't done stand up at all. I've just been trying to do the podcast thing a little bit right. more. I started a Patreon, and I think this is the few, like people do do stand up on Zoom and stuff. I'm just not comfortable with that because I right. like being in front of people. I like that audience. I like that stage feel. But yeah. I never shoot down somebody who does that who can make that work for them. But for me, this is. What Could you I see yourself right like in the, the future podcast. charging for like a stand up special via like Zoom or something? If I can get out of my head, if I can get out of my way to figure out how to do stand up via Zoom, probably. But right. I can't get out of my head right now. I'm like, <laughs> nah, I'm going to just do <laughs> podcasting and, and talk to the camera. Word. Versus standing there like, hey, so this happened. <laughs> so, but who knows? If this thing goes on for two more months, you may see me doing Zoom comedy shows. Word, word. At least yeah. it's good to know yeah. that it's not going to stop your creativity. And and me, as well as I know, millions of others are looking forward to more content from you. Because you're, you're honestly hilarious. You're a genius. And, and I Thank can't you. wait to see what you're going to come out with next. Thank you. I'm I'm shooting right now. I just have I have a podcast by myself. That's like 20 minutes called The Row Show. That's on my Patreon. I have a, a six foot nothing podcast with me and my homies. Uh, it's also on the Patreon. Um, then I have no need for apologies with me and my homie Derek. That's on YouTube and stuff like that. But 
This is it. I'm just I'm moving <laughs> with the times. I I'm going to do my first like Q and A while playing video games on YouTube. Nice. I'm just going to be playing. Yeah, I, I can't do Warzone because you can hear people talking. So I'm going to do just Mortal Kombat. I'm going to switch it up, do Mortal <laughs> Kombat, play video games, and just do a Q&A. But I think right now is the time for more engagement, you know? It's the time Absolutely. to just, like, talk to the people who support you. Right. It's it's That's, time to yeah. prove your, your your evolution in the game and how you're going to... How are you going to adjust to what's going on? Yeah. And my wife, she's over. She's always over my shoulder. She's like, baby, I, I don't see you engaging on social media. And I'm like, but I'm doing stuff. So it's like, yeah, but I didn't see you respond to this comment. And it's, so she's on me. My wife That's is on up. me. And she's very, yo, and she's very blunt. She has no way of sugarcoating shit. That's a beautiful thing, man. My wife was just on top of me about giving me a... She's like, let me give you a shape up before you go on live. I'm like, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> hold on. I don't know I about mean, that. I might go wrong. right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, do you see this? <laughs> My wife, I'm like, look, I don't know what the hell is going to happen with this. I'm like, babe, can you shape up the back of my neck? She's like, no. What if I mess it up? I'm like, worse than this? Just, <laughs> no one's going to see the back of my neck, even if you can write your initials back there, and I won't know. <laughs> my wife will not my wife will not touch my head that's hilarious yeah now as far as i'm yeah. concerned i'm wearing straight hats every interview until we can finally go outside i know that i'm gonna need like 10 barbers when this is done everybody's gonna be yeah. looking like that that caveman from wacky racers like cousin it when they're going to get yeah. their wax appointment <laughs> or going to the barber shop it's gonna be crazy but yeah. i appreciate you monroe martin for joining us today you're an amazing talent can't wait to see what you put out next. Everybody, check out, listen to all three of his podcasts. You have three podcasts, right? I have three podcasts. Yes. Three podcasts. No need for apologies. Six for nothing podcast in the row show. And stream all of his stand-ups on YouTube. Get all his numbers up, even though he doesn't need it because he's blowing up already. But stream them. I all still right? need it. Click, click that it. refresh button. Give him all the streams you could possibly get so they could get him back on that stage because we need to see more of him on that. And where else can they catch you on? Shout out your Instagram. Shout out your Twitter. My Instagram is Monroe Martin. I, I, I. That's Monroe Martin the third. That's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Nice. And my YouTube is also YouTube.com uh, forward slash Monroe Martin. I, I, I. My man, I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us today. This is the Juan Ayala Show. Monroe Martin, thank you for joining us today. You're the man. And have a great day. Stay blessed. Yeah, and we look forward to more things from you. Uh, thank you. Up and you are rocking with the Juan Ayala show with a chunk glad that's going to whip. Hola, soy yo, Landa Vega, and you're watching Platano Man. Rocket Launcher. Platano Man.